Well, good evening and welcome. It's uh, really a pleasure to welcome you. Uh, and let me start by acknowledging the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples on whose unceded traditional territories we are, of course, privileged to gather this evening. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first in the 2017-18 President's Faculty Lecture Series. Um, I want to thank you for joining us for what promises. Now, normally I say what promises to be an evening of big ideas, but I think I'm going to say of wild ideas tonight. <laughs> Um, hopefully you know by now that SFU has made it our mission to be Canada's most community-engaged research university. And in furtherance of that mission, one of, our, uh, one of our programs, this one, is designed to really provide the community a chance to hear from some of our faculty members who are doing really exciting work. And uh, tonight's speaker certainly fits that bill. The idea being, of course, that if you hear from us and we hear back from you, we will both benefit from the exchange. And I want you to know there will be an opportunity after today's lecture for you to ask questions and have comment. And then, indeed, after the lecture, there's uh, some modest um, refreshments at the back, and you're welcome to stay. And Rudy's kindly agreed to stay and have some, uh, have some conversation as well. I should also uh, tell you that uh, either warn you or excite you by telling you that this lecture will be filmed for and available in our SFU YouTube channel. And I say that because if you do ask a question, that means you may become a YouTube star yourself in the process. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, our speaker. And I'm so appreciative that Dr. Ru Rudy Reimer Youngs is an associate who's an associate professor of archaeology and First Nations studies, has, a has agreed to be our first speaker of this series. He's a member of the Squamish Nation. He joined SFU in 1994 and has been studying and sharing the history of the Squamish Nation and other indigenous peoples for over two decades. He uh, became interested in archaeology and the past by listening to his grandfather and other community elders' stories about Squamish Nation history. He earned a degree at Capilano College, now known as Capilano University, before coming to SFU to study his master's in archaeology. And after his earning his master's at SFU and consulting, he then went on to earn his doctorate in archaeology at McMaster University. Uh, he was, by the way, an important part of the team working on Squamish Nation land use planning and other initiatives while consulting and further his knowledge uh, in, in that endeavor as well. Uh, his research explores the connection between cultural knowledge and science. He's been featured in television documentaries, and I want to see this one, because it says including a documentary on Discovery Channel on Bigfoot. Is that right? <laughs> wow. Some for us all to check out and look forward to. He is perhaps better known as the host of Wild Archaeology, the series that uh, has been airing on Aboriginal People's Television Network and just started filming its second season this summer. And I want to tell you, we hosted a big event last spring, the uh, Community University Expo. Had uh, over 500 people from across the country here to talk about university community engagement. And I had someone come up to me and said, do you know Rudy Reimer? <laughs> and I said, yeah, he's a faculty member. Oh, is there any chance I could meet him? I watch all of his shows. And I said, well, if, if he's here, I'll, I'll introduce you. <laughs> As it happened, Rudy uh, didn't connect. But uh, I don't know, maybe you're there tonight, the person who raised this. So Rudy is truly a TV star, as well as a professor and researcher. And uh, it, it's, if you haven't seen it, I really, and after tonight's lecture, you'll want to see Wild Archaeology. It is the first documentary television series in the world that explores the archaeological record of Canada's indigenous peoples from the point of view of indigenous peoples and uh, shines important light on that knowledge and enables those of us who aren't indigenous to learn an awful lot we couldn't learn in any other way. In addition to being a TV star, Rudy, of course, uh, publishes. Uh, he's published numerous articles, supervised several master's students, and we're so pleased, Rudy, that you've taken time from your busy schedule and TV shoot to uh, present this lecture. So please join with me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Rudy Reimer. <laughs> Youngs, Rudy. Uh, uh, President Petter, 
thank you for that uh, very uh, kind introduction. It's uh, kind of nice to hear all the things that you've done over the, the many, many years. And uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here tonight. And thank you for coming. It's uh, pretty much a full crowd here. We might need some new chairs if more people come in. So that's really, really good. Um, so yes, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take off my jacket. I've been walking around downtown Vancouver with various appointments today. Uh, it was on CBC Radio, and uh, just want to be a little more comfortable. So, uh, wild archaeology. Just a quick show of hands. Who has watched or seen the show? Okay, so roughly about half. Okay. The half of you who didn't put up your hand, hopefully after this evening, you will go on to APTN's website, Wild Archaeology, and you can binge watch all 13 episodes. <laughs> uh, they're only 22 minutes long, so uh, it's just like Netflix. And uh, as President Petter alluded to, we've started filming season two this past summer, and we will continue filming next summer, spring, summer, and fall. And then there will be another year of post-production. So. Uh, it's exciting, it's happening, but unfortunately, uh, you'll have to wait a little longer for season two. So yeah, uh, the reason why I got involved in this, I got a phone call from our producer director, Tracy German of Pale Fox Pictures in Toronto. I was sitting in my office after teaching one of my classes and I was getting ready to go home and she called me up and said, would you like to be on a TV show? And I said, maybe. <laughs> um, <clears throat> As it just happened back in 2011, I was getting ready to fly back to McMaster to defend my dissertation. So we had a meeting in Toronto, Pearson Airport, uh, put some ideas down on paper. Uh, that following spring, we filmed a teaser uh, up in Squamish, sent that off to APTN. We waited and waited, and then they said, we like it. Go ahead, film a full 13 episode season. And so I got really excited then because, uh, as Andrew mentioned, this is the first TV show anywhere that incorporates in a meaningful way the perspectives of Indigenous peoples, um, their history and archaeology. And so for me, uh, back in my MA days uh, at SFU uh, in archaeology, my fellow grad students and I, we sat in the pub going, oh yeah, it'd be really cool to make a good archaeology TV show. And here it is. So let's get into more, more of the serious things. Well, you might uh, be asking the question to yourself, well, what is Indigenous archaeology? Um, good colleague at, up at SFU, George Nicholas, if you want to read into this more, uh, I asked permission to use uh, the cover of this book um, tonight. Uh, I've got a chapter in there as well. Uh, it's uh, stories of indigenous archaeologists from around the world. So what is indigenous archaeology? How is it different than conventional archaeology that you may have been exposed to? Well, loosely defined uh, archaeology, it's the archaeology done with, by, and for indigenous communities. And so this doesn't just include participation in fieldwork, in excavations and surveys, it's the care for ancestral remains, be they human remains or artifacts and other, other things, and other elements of indigenous cultural heritage, such as oral history, language, place names, and so on. And this indigenous archeology span has only arisen within the discipline over the last 20 to 30 years. Prior to that, much of the archeology span that was done across North America was without the consent of First Nations communities or uh, Native American communities in the, in the United States. And there was heavy critique from those communities about archeology span and what archeologists span were doing. And so the good th thing of any academic discipline is to listen and learn and change. And so uh, many archeologists span start going, we have to change our practice, how we do things, why we do things. And up until where we are now in modern day, I see many of my good colleagues here, uh, John, Dave, many others in the department at SFU, uh, practice uh, various forms of Indigenous archaeology, where it's the communities who are setting the research agenda. And this, I think, fulfills the, the uh, uh, engagement part of SFU, how we meaningfully engage with communities. And so, yeah, we're mo it's moving beyond basic consultation. 
<clears throat> it's forming true collaborations. And it allows indigenous designed projects to explore their that community's heritage. And so this is something I do within Squamish Nation community and I've done a little bit uh, with other communities across uh, British Columbia and beyond. And so what's really exciting in the last five, 10 years is that Indigenous archaeology is not just an academic thing anymore. Our students are taking up on this and they're going on into cultural resource management or the business side of archaeology and implementing the philosophy of Indigenous archaeology in business practice. We have uh, an MA in heritage resource management now. And uh, again, John Welch is uh, uh, a strong steerer of that. And so over the last uh, few, you know, 10 years, there's been a lot of change within the discipline and this will continue on. And it's uh, really exciting to be part of that. There's even a coalition of indigenous archaeologists across North America that was started back, uh, estimated in 2010. And uh, this was a result of uh, indigenous archaeologists meeting at, at national conferences and sort of talking in back rooms going, how are we going to change things? And so, well, I've got it. We, we all have our own ideas. And so uh, my uh, way of adjust, uh, doing Indigenous archaeology is, well, it's something I experience when I talk to my home community and I, I talk about archaeology and people are scratching their head and going, what are you talking about? And so it's, for me, this TV show is bringing archaeology to a broader audience and moving away from some of the technical talk that we do in academia and reaching out to a much larger audience than we would ever hope to have uh, through publications in academic journals and books. So yeah, wild archaeology, uh, why? These are some of the reasons that uh, I got involved in it. Uh, yeah, I wanted to focus on science of archaeology as well, but also stress the First Nations community's perspectives have their voices, their knowledge and experience uh, to show this is archaeology by, with, and for those people. Uh, and really looking, uh, you know, we think about archaeology as prehistory. Well, I think of it as deep history. There, there's no disconnect there. Uh, and really stressing the values of cultural knowledge, place names, language, traditions, and so on. And so for me, uh, Wild Archaeology as a TV series is Indigenous archaeology in a new form. It's media. It's reaching out to a, a much larger audience. And so, yeah, here we are filming the teaser back in 2011. Uh, that's my cousin, Hetzelem, or Dustin Rivers. Uh, he was originally supposed to be one of the hosts. Um, and there's Jennifer Brusso, one of the other co-hosts, and the, the film crew. Uh, Hetzelem decided to back out before we started filming uh, season one because he wanted to revitalize the Squamish language. And he is doing that through SFU as well. Uh, here at Harbor Center, uh, one of my other cousins here, Aaron, uh, has played a part in that as well. And uh, it's really exciting. And so it, it, that's very good to see. But uh, once we did the teaser, again, uh, there was uh, money became available when APTN said we'd like it. And so that allowed us to go from coast to coast to coast across the country, filming 13 episodes in 2014 and 15. And so one of the other reasons what inspired me to do this was <laughs> looking on TV, you turn on to History Channel or Discovery or other stations and you see all these kind of shows. Well, uh, uh, an archaeologist uh, uh, Pep, uh, and a filmmaker, Pepe and Zarniski, uh, teamed up and they actually wrote a book about uh, making archaeological documentaries. And their text was a good start to show, well, how do we disseminate archaeological information uh, through media uh, such as TV? Well, their book, I found it to be pretty practical, but it was kind of a repetitive guide of how to do an archaeology TV show. Uh, and they really stressed, well, the filmmaker and the archaeologist had to work creatively together. And it's like, well, that kind of goes without saying if you want to make any production. Um, but um, yeah, their book, I found it to be very uh, um, repetitive. It didn't even touch on the ethics of going into communities and talking about their cultural knowledge. Uh, and they could have used some 
case examples in their book. And I, I was like, so uh, before the filming of uh, the first season, these were the things that were going through my head. And it's like, how do we do an ethically sound yet informative TV show that respects cultural knowledge and focuses on the science of archaeology? And so going into the, the filming, the, these were the things, the concerns that I had um, going on. And every location that we went to, uh, every community is different. Uh, every set is different. The weather changes and so on. So who's involved in this? Uh, well, for those of you who've seen this show, you, you know this, but I'll uh, introduce some of the people. Of course, I am one of the hosts. Uh, this is me doing some of my research. And uh, there's uh, President Petter and I at another event uh, last year. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm uh, the main archaeologist on the show, but uh, I'm teamed up with uh, this fellow, Jacob Pratt, who is Dakota and an Anishabne uh, descent. He's now living in Los, An Los Angeles. Uh, he's uh, partaked in uh, as a voice actor on cartoon shows for kids. Uh, he does his own videography. Uh, he loves flying his drone. Uh, he is a spectacular hoop dancer. Uh, he attends powwows uh, uh, all over the place, and uh, he's a great composer of music uh, with flute and on stage productions. So uh, Jacob is an up-and-coming uh, star. you got to watch out for this guy, and uh, it's great to have him on board. And uh, then there's Jennifer Brusso. She's uh, Ojibwe from the Serpent River First Nation near Subway and Manitoulin Island. Uh, she's based out of Vancouver. She uh, is also an actor and singer uh, with many other uh, productions under her belt. Uh, she uh, does stage work and uh, is also a teacher and an activist uh, here in Vancouver. And uh, what's really been interesting with uh, Jen uh, on set, she has this incredible growing interest in ethnobotany uh, because uh, she's been inflicted with uh, Lyme's disease from a tick bite. And so uh, she's been learning about ethnobotany from the communities where we've been traveling, and many of the uh, remedies that she's found uh, have been helping her health. And so that's uh, really nice to see. And so there's a very large production team. I'll quickly go through them. This is Tracy German, our producer-director. Uh, this is her baby. Uh, 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 there are many other people involved. Uh, Ian Thompson, Karen, uh, Hansen, uh, uh, Sammy, uh, one of our sound guys, uh, camera and sound people all the way down this list. Uh, really, they're working behind the scenes uh, of the camera, and it's their hard work that uh, on set uh, over very many long days that gets this done. And uh, it's really incredible to work with these people. You get to know them. We, we live together. We're on the road together. We eat together, uh, and so on. Um, and... Uh, uh, without them, uh, the, the experience would be uh, much uh, more difficult. And um, you can notice um, there are John Elliott, who is a Tuscarora descent. Uh, he's with us still on uh, season two. Uh, it's great to have indigenous filmmakers uh, as part of this. Tracy German uh, as well. She has uh, Mi'kmaq and uh, Haudenosaunee uh, ancestry as well. So it's... Uh, you know, we're, it, it's like a, an indigenous uh, movement here going on within the within media. So what I'd like to quickly do is, uh, if you haven't seen the series, let's quickly run through some of the uh, all the episodes. Uh, I told Tracy episode one has to be in Squamish and has to be Alpine archaeology because that's what I do. And so we uh, explored many sites up there, got into the high country. Uh, one of the first troubles that we had. I thought Tracy had money for a helicopter. We didn't. Uh, so I had to hike the crew up a logging road and uh, uh, sort of tell them and encourage them, oh, it's just another 100 meters. And yeah, my sister can relate to this. Uh, I've taken her, taken her into the high country as well. But for me, it was an excellent opportunity to focus on the research that I've been doing up in the Alpine and other places uh, for over 20 years now, and uh, look at archaeological sites that are in locations that people would not think there's anything there. And so, again, we're changing, uh, getting rid of the misconceptions about people and their ancient past. And so, 
Uh, doing research in the Alpine is very uh, difficult at times because there's snowpack and uh, adverse weather conditions. But you can see when you get up there, it's, it's incredibly beautiful. So uh, episode one was, uh, uh, for me, it, my bias here, it's uh, one of my favorites. So where else did we go? Uh, here's some of the Alpine shots, some of the weather that we encountered, uh, hiking up the road, uh, some of the logistical challenges. Uh, this is the, the big picture uh, up here. The, we're standing on top of a 7,000-year-old site. Uh, that comes from radiocarbon dates from a, a hearth or fire pit feature uh, associated with microblades, a specific form of technology. But this is in August, and usually there's no snow. But this varies from year to year. And so we managed to get what we needed in that episode and uh, 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 have some incredible scenery in scene one. Uh, episodes two and three, we went up to the southern Yukon with the White River First Nation. And these episodes focused on the ancient environments uh, that archaeologists refer to as Beringia. And we were at the Little John site, which is uh, northeastern of Yukon College, where he's been working in collaboration with the White River First Nation for many years. And this is one of the oldest sites in Beringia. And so there's the... Uh, 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 the Bering Land Bridge, people came over from Northeast Asia thousands and thousands of years ago. This is one of the oldest sites uh, dating back to those times. And so what was fantastic is to actually get into these excavation units. You can see the various layers. These dark layers are where the cultural deposits are. And associated with these dark layers are animal remains of extinct megafauna, uh, along with various uh, projectile points that are, are time sensitive. And what was really encouraging to see is the incredible involvement of the White River First Nation in their ancient past. Uh, some of the kids from the community are better excavators than some of the undergrads that I've taught. <laughs> um, but what's really incredible about this site is that the, they, they have oral history of volcanic eruptions, and we see that in the archaeological record. We have, they have oral history about uh, changing environments and ancient animals walking the land that were five, ten times size, or size than they are today. And we see that in the archaeology at Little John site. So that was an incredible experience uh, living up there in, uh, where the sun never really goes down. It was very difficult to sleep. Uh, um, Norm faces some logistical challenges of his own. This was the site before we arrived. This is the main excavation block uh, of the Little John site. And of course, they get a lot of snow up there. And when it melts, um, Norm shows up in the late spring, early summer, and this is what he returns to. So he has to drain the pool, or the pit of despair, as he calls it, and uh, to be able to go in and do the systematic uh, work that he wants. And uh, here are just some of the other shots of us uh, excavating, filming, and uh, coming across various other things. Uh, this is one of my former uh, uh, BA honor students, uh, Jordan Handley, who's been working at the site for many, many years, uh, helping out with our portable X-ray fluorescence instrument, uh, looking at uh, the differences in the sediments down through the, uh, the profile of the site seeing if there are changes, uh, if we can detect changes, environmental changes, uh, within the, the chemistry of the sediments. And these are some uh, ancient bison antiquis, or extinct uh, bison, that were uh, twice or three times the size as modern buffalo. So moving along, episodes four and five, uh, I sent Jen and Jacob on a solo mission to test their archaeological skills. And so they went all the way up to Richardson Island in the Mackenzie Del Delta uh, to work with Max Reason of the University of Toronto. And he has a long-term project of doing salvage archaeology uh, at this site. It's a large Chile village site that dates to the last thousand years that is literally eroding out of the permafrost into the Arctic Ocean. And this, of course, is all due to climate change the warming temperatures. And uh, they're doing what we call rescue archaeology. And the main component of the site here dates to the last 400 years. And what's really incredible, since many of the artifacts and features have been frozen, literally frozen in time, there's incredible preservation. 
And so you can see some of the bone, the wood, and stone artifacts here uh, that they're excavating. Uh, it gives us incredible insight into the last 500 to 1,000 years of uh, the ancestors of our modern day Inuit in the far north. And here you can see on the beach, these are whale bones uh, <coughs> eroding out. Uh, the Thule, the ancestors of the modern day Inuit, uh, were and still are expert sea mammal hunters. And this site was located at a key intercept point of migrating beluga and other whales. So they had intimate knowledge of their environment. And um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that this site is literally melting like ice cream on a hot day into the ocean. And of course, uh, doing archeological work in the far north is a extreme challenge. The bugs are horrendous. There are, are polar bears and other things. Um, and uh, food, you know, you're living on spam and jam and so on. It's a, it's a pretty tough go. And so uh, you can see Jacob and Jen here, they quickly bonded with uh, the Inuit uh, folks that were involved uh, on this project. And uh, I think that really helped them and the uh, film crew get through filming these episodes. So moving on, episode six, uh, we went out to Ontario and we looked at what's referred to as underwater archaeology in the Great Lakes. And this was a great opportunity to, for me to meet up with an old friend and colleague from McMaster, uh, Lisa Sonnenberg, who has just finished her postdoc at the Univers University of Michigan. And her research, along with others, uh, looked at bathymetric readings or underwater sort of radar and sonar um, in areas uh, in Lake Huron between the state of Michigan and the province of Ontario. And they were focusing on these ridge lines that are now underwater. And they went down with an underwater drone uh, along with uh, scuba teams themselves. And they started finding these linear arrangements of stones on top of these ridges. And the oral history of many people in this part of the world, the indigenous people, say, well, yeah, uh, we have oral history of these ridges that used to connect this place to that place. And there were lakes on either side. And uh, they refer to them uh, as tunnels, as travelways to get from one place to another. So here's a map of the bathymetric uh, readings of Lake Huron. Here's Georgian Bay. This is a Manitoulin area up here, beautiful part of uh, Ontario. But here, the, the yellow, these are areas that would have been exposed. Back then, the Great Lakes uh, did not have as much water supply. The water flow was going over more towards the uh, St. Lawrence River. Uh, this is about 10,000 years ago. And uh, also, the weight of the glaciers had pressed down on the Earth's crust so much that when the ice melted away, the land bounced back up. And this, this is what we refer to as isostatic rebound. And what happened, of course, it changed the flow of the water in many different directions. And so this part of Lake Huron was, is, was uh, uh, the water was much lower than it is today. And here is what they refer to as the Amberley Ridge. And this is where they were finding those linear rock formations. So what's the big deal about rocks in lines? Well, that's a great thing in archaeology, right? You probably heard about the Nazca lines down in, in Peru and so on. Well, rock lines are all over the place. And archaeologists, we find them. Other people find them. And very often we have to say, well, that's not really anything because, you know, we have to look at the context and so on. Anyhow, this is, again, further up north in the subarctic and Arctic. Uh, this is a, a caribou uh, hunting uh, uh, linear feature. And you can see uh, the rocks have been moved in purposeful ways. And you can see this round area here. This is a hunting blind where the hunters would hunker down. And, of course, this is along a known caribou migration route. The caribou follow the same route year after year, generation after generation. They're predictable. And of course, people in the ancient past picked up on that. And it was like, okay, where do we set up one of these things? Where is it going to be easy for us to hunt these animals? And then as the caribou would come along here, they don't have really good eyesight. And so they get funneled along these, these fence walls and the hunters would hunker down here and they just 
the caribou would walk by, you just jump up and there's your dinner. So were these hunting features now underwater, uh, but originally created and exposed 10,000 years ago? Well, here's some of the maps that uh, Lisa sent me and agreed that I could use for this evening's talk. Uh, here are the, the rock line arrangements. And you can see this is where the caribou would come. And here are some of those uh, hunting blinds. And uh, here's some of the, the photos from underwater, what they look like. Oh, very fine. That's kind of interesting. Some of you may not be convinced. Some of my fellow archaeologists out there kind of rubbing their, their chins. Well, what Lisa and others did was to core some of the sediments in and around these hunting features to take samples and bring them back up to the surface, go through them with fine screens and see what's in there. And this is one of the things that Lisa is really good at is identifying what we refer to in archaeology as micro debitage. And people in the ancient past manufactured stone tools. And as you do that, when you're knocking off pieces of a larger rock to create an arrowhead or uh, other implements, there is the shatter, the debris. And this is what turns up within these hunting blinds. And so what do hunters do when you're sitting there waiting for the caribou? You make sure your tools are nice and sharp. And this is the end result. And so uh, it's I, I was not convinced at first, but over filming these episodes, I was like, okay, I can jive with this. This is interesting. And nearby, uh, you, you kind of look at these stone tools. So, well, what are they made out of? And the, the tool stone in this area of the Great Lakes, it's mostly quartzite. So the nec next episode, we went and visited a quarry site known as Chaguinda. And uh, this is Pat Julig of uh, Laurentian University. Uh, who also taught sessionally here at SFU uh, back in the 90s, uh, he in investigated this quarry site in, uh, up in Manitoulin Island uh, over many, many years. And so uh, Pat, myself, and my co-host, Jen and Jacob, uh, learned flint napping from uh, Pat Julig. And uh, we found, through experimental archaeology, of replicating arrowheads, like this one shown here, that many of the, much of the micro debitage that we uh, produced from making our arrowheads resembled many of the much of the micro debitage that was being found uh, now underwater from one of these ancient land bridges in Lake Huron. So that was very informative, and so Pat Julik and I are now looking at uh, doing some additional testing to find out the elemental chemistry of these materials through XRF and other processes. And so that'll be exciting uh, research down the road. Uh, during this episode as well, this was uh, near Jen's home territory of Serpent River. So uh, she got to spend time w within her community. We attended uh, the local powwow uh, and partook in the uh, potato dance. Has anyone done the potato dance? Oh, you got to try it. It's, it's a lot of fun. But it was a great time to uh, just sort of do some interesting archaeology, but again, stress talking to the communities about their oral history and how it meshes with the archaeological investigations that are being done now underwater in Lake Huron. And many of their oral histories speak of these connections between uh, and across the Great Lakes. Uh, episode 8, we got to come back to uh, British Columbia and uh, uh, Another SFU alumnus, uh, Farid Ramtula, who uh, did his PhD at SFU Archaeology, uh, is now faculty at University of Northern BC, was uh, working in conjunction with uh, the Haikai Network um, uh, up on the Central Coast on Calvert Island. And uh, uh, he had the good luck to run a field school up there. Uh, so he had a, an army of students and uh, the strong support of the Kai Network, uh, who have an excellent research base on Calvert Island. And Farid uh, did his PhD on a famous site on the Central Coast known as Namu, and it's a really deep site. If you go to the museum up at SFU, the Burnaby campus, you can see a profile or a, a section of the site. And that one is only about two or three meters deep. But... Uh, Farad chose a site on Calvert Island, and uh, uh, it's over five meters deep. 
And uh, I really encourage you to watch this episode because you can see how incredibly dangerous and kind of scary it is <laughs> climbing down the ladder, uh, you know, over five meters deep. So that's, you know, that's 25. How many, how many feet is that? I don't know. <laughs> and so he finally hit bottom. And uh, of course, what he wanted to do here was to demonstrate the antiquity of Heltzik oral narratives about their ancient past. And uh, this area of the Central Coast is fascinating because I mentioned the glaciers earlier for the Great Lakes. Here on the coast, we had big glaciers as well. And of course, that pressed down here on the mainland. But out on the outer islands, Vancouver Island, Haida Gwaii, essentially it was like a teeter-totter like this. And so the inner coast would have been depressed while the outer coast would have been lifted. And so the sea level history in these locations is dramatically different. The reason why Farad chose this location, it's right on that fulcrum and the sea level didn't change very much. And so that's why we get these incredible deep shell mid sites, ancient, ancient, continuous occupation going back well over 10,000 years. And here's a picture of Farad at the bottom <laughs> and, uh, and uh, it, it's incredible. Uh, I, I, did, I did not want to go down there. I felt uh, scared. Uh, so uh, here's Farad Ramtula. This is Elroy White. I'll talk more about Elroy in a little bit. But this is after dinner at the, the lodge at Hekai. And uh, the food there was incredibly good. It was like a five-star chef. And Farad said, this is the only project I've ever worked on where you actually gain weight. Uh, because typically archaeologists, when we go in the field, we, we, you know, you work out every day, and so you get really fit. Um, but this was an, an incredible demonstration of the very ancient history of uh, Heltzik oral narratives. And to expand on that, in episode nine, uh, Elroy White or uh, Aeneas uh, took us on a tour of the inlets of Heltzik territory. We went to Namu, that famous site that I mentioned earlier. Koi, Koi River, which is uh, an incredible location where there is active uh, education for Heltzik youth. Um, and what this episode really stressed was the more recent oral history of, of the Heltzik nation uh, as it focuses on resource uh, gathering, but also management and the lessons that we can learn from indigenous cultural knowledge about how to manage fisheries like herring and salmon and so on that uh, many of these uh, forms of uh, cultural knowledge should be implemented in modern day because uh, our resources are continually stressed all up and down the coast and of, on, the, on the mainland as well. Uh, but this was, uh, for me, one of my favorite episodes because it was the entire cast was Indigenous people. There was myself, Jen, Jacob, and Elroy. Elroy was the expert archaeologist. He did his MA at SFU Archaeology as well. And uh, his uh, MA thesis is uh, still a really good read. Uh, he uh, titled it The Production, uh, the Products of My Ancestors' Labor in uh, reference to fish traps in Heltzik territory. And uh, just some of the incredible scenery uh, up on the central coast. Um, again, in this episode, this is an old house post that's still standing. Uh, 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 up one of the inlets. Here's the Koi River, where uh, the ongoing educa cultural education is happening. And uh, this is the old uh, site of Namu. This is the uh, the old cannery that sits on top of the site. And uh, we went back there to try and relocate some of the old excavations that Roar Carlson uh, did in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, but everything had been dramatically overgrown and uh, the uh, old cannery has been long abandoned. It was kind of like going to a ghost town. And uh, so for episode 10, to move things along here, uh, folk, we went out to southern Alberta to uh, uh, Blackfoot territory and visited the very famous uh, site Head Smashed In. It's a world her uh, heritage site. Uh, if you ever have a chance to go there or if you've been there, it's, it's a great place, you know, good to go. Um, but uh, the provincial archaeologist, Jack Brink, has done research here for many decades. Uh, Tracy German identified him as uh, the expert on the site. We also talked with uh, Reg Croshu, who was a, a Blackfoot elder 
We got to sit in his TP for many hours, share stories, and learn about Head Smashed In from a Blackfoot perspective. Uh, but the main thing that he stressed to us was the, the cultural protocols about hunting buffalo and the relationship that the Blackfoot have with these animals. And really, that is a theme that goes throughout uh, the entire series, the relationships that Indigenous people have with the plants and the animals of the natural world. And so what made uh, another fun thing uh, about this episode was uh, Jacob and uh, the film crew uh, got to use a drone. And so they were flying this uh, drone. It was buzzing around. It sounds sounds like a giant mosquito. And uh, <clears throat> they dropped it off uh, the... Uh, the cliff here I've had smashed in. So those of you who don't know how this uh, works, uh, this is a very large cliff. It's about a 20, 30 meter drop. Uh, in behind it, I'll show more pictures as we go along, there's a huge gathering area. And this is where the Blackfoot and other people would funnel the buffalo with uh, drive lanes, similar to what we saw underwater in Lake Huron. And they would direct them. Uh, they would section off part of the herd. They wouldn't take the whole herd. They would drive them over this cliff and the, the buffalo would drop down to their deaths. Or if they didn't die from the fall, there would be uh, people waiting for them to finish them off. And uh, this is a communal hunt and provided a huge amount of resource uh, resources uh, for people to live throughout the fall and winter months. And so it's incredible use of the landscape, knowing the knowledge of animals and their behavior, and uh, has been in use for uh, uh, about 6,000 years. So here's Jack uh, giving us the tour. This is the gathering basin in behind the site. Uh, <clears throat> here's some of the, uh, we're standing on top of some of the rocks, which would be anchors to uh, 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 pile up bush and uh, other material uh, to aid in funneling the buffalo over that precipice uh, that is known as head smashed in. And just a, a, a note, uh, you may have heard this as a buffalo jump head smashed in. Well, buffalo don't jump willingly over a cliff. Uh, they had to be driven. And so uh, where the head smash comes in is actually it's the, the oral history of uh, the very first communal hunt here where a young boy was at the bottom of the cliff and he didn't know the buffalo were coming. And one of the buffalo, as it came down, uh, landed on top of him. And this course, his head got smashed in. So that's where the head smashed in comes from. It's not the buffalo getting their head smashed in. It refers to an unfortunate young boy who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, here are some modern buffalo that we got to film. Uh, this is a ranch just over in Saskatchewan. Uh, we did go to uh, another site, uh, Bodo, which is uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan border, but uh, that, that never materialized as an episode. But uh, if you're ever out on, on the prairies and see a rock like this, it's very worn and shiny. This is a buffalo rubbing stone. And uh, again, this is how indigenous people of the plains observed the behaviors of the animals that they were in tune with. Uh, the buffalo, of course, they get itchy and scratchy. And so they would wallow around these rocks, rubbing themselves up against it to, to scratch themselves. And so knowing where these were, those, of course, uh, other locations other than head smashed in would be good places to hunt, hunt the buffalo. And of course, we weren't filming all the time. Uh, we did have time off in in between episodes. Uh, uh, the... Depending on locations, some of the locations had great spots. Uh, uh, we got to play pool and hang out. Uh, here's Jacob doing a uh, hoop dance at Head Smashed In on Aboriginal Day. Uh, here's Liam taking a break while filming. Uh, some of the scenes that we shot would go on for 45 minutes, and you can imagine holding a camera without a tripod. And so his back got very sore. Uh, and one of the things, those of you who've seen all the episodes, there's a friendly competition between Jen and Jacob in applying their knowledge and skills uh, in, in each episode. And uh, this is an example of uh, Jacob's um, stone and brush that uh, was constructed as part of the, uh, the drive complex. And uh, Jen and Jacob have these comp competitions throughout each episode. And then I judge who did better. And... Uh, in this episode, Jen bribed me with some chocolate. 
And of course, there are some bad days on set, and I have to uh, put the uh, crew back in order. I, sometimes I have to use force. Uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> moving along, episode 11, uh, I was really looking forward to this uh, episode because we went all the way out to Labrador uh, to uh, work with Scott Nielsen here of Memorial University. And uh, he's working with uh, Shashushe, their uh, Inu uh, nation in Labrador. And uh, what was incredible about this location was uh, the oral history that they have of the ocean front, the beach, being much further inland than it is now. And so what Scott's research is doing in inland of Labrador is finding these old beach ridges that are now well over 100 kilometers away from modern shoreline. And so he's looking at ancient environments and how the ancestors of the Inu reacted to changing sea levels. Uh, here and in the Arctic, our sea levels are going up. Out there, the ocean is retreating because, again, the glaciers press down on the land and the land is still rebounding. And so this, is still, this has been a process that's been going on for thousands of years. And so along all these beach ridges, Scott is finding archaeological sites. And so it's an a incredible environment. If you go to Labrador or if you go to northern BC, it looks exactly the same. It's this continuous boreal forest. And it, it, it's really uh, something unique about Canada. And uh, just to give you an idea of here's one of these ridges. It's the, whoop, there's a drop. That was oceanfront 4,000 years ago. And so you survey along these ridges, and that's where you find the sites, projectile points and other things. And so Scott goes out and excavates these with the, the consent and approval of, of the Sheshushe. And uh, it was really incredible uh, what Scott also does in uh, the community, the reserve. There's one of these beach ridges, uh, and of course, uh, Many First Nations communities need housing. And so before they build a new house, Scott goes and does an excavation on where those houses are going to be. And of course, that involves local community members, and uh, they get to uh, experience their ancient past firsthand before the construction of the house uh, happens. Uh, Jacob turned into a star here because he was flying his drone. Uh, it was an incredible uh, experience uh, for these young kids. And uh, I made the mistake of sharing my lunch with, one, with them one day, and I didn't get, get any of my food, but uh, that was fine. They were happy. So while we were in Labrador, we also went down a uh, uh, little further east, even, from Shashushe. We went out to the coast, and this is where uh, Dr. Lisa Rankin at Memorial uh, University was working at the double uh, MER site. And uh, this is out at Riglet. There's a very small community in Labrador. And uh, uh, this uh, excavation that she's been doing over many years is a, a historical site. It's a, a more, where it's more recent in time. It's uh, about 200 years old. And it's really interesting. These houses that they're excavating, they're a mixture of European and First Nations uh, materials. And there's uh, evidence of men intermarrying into the coastal uh, Labrador Inuit communities uh, happening around this time. And so what's really uh, intriguing is the materials inside the house are the Inuit women doing their things. And outside the house are the European men artifacts. So uh, it kind of reminds me when my wife gets mad at me, you know, I have to leave the house. <laughs> So, uh, but her research is uh, uh, really interesting because uh, this is the southernmost Inuit community in Canada. And uh, seeing the cultural interaction uh, within these houses, here's a completely excavated one. Uh, this is the floor, stone line floor. Uh, you can see the entrance over here. Uh, there are fire pits, uh, sleeping areas and benches and so on. Uh, this takes many, many years uh, of uh, uh, hard work and uh, uh, Lisa is still working at this site and, and others to get an idea of this regional interaction between uh, Europeans and the Inuit uh, hundreds of years ago. So here's a quick rundown of all the episodes and where we've gone from coast to coast to coast across the entire country 
And each episode, of course, has a theme. It has a lead archaeologist. However, uh, you know, the, you know, being on the road, sitting in airports, going on boat rides, uh, you know, waiting for the crew to set up in lab scenes or elsewhere, it, this takes a lot of time. Each episode uh, takes about a week and a half to film, and that gets boiled down to 22 minutes of actual airtime. And so uh, it's interesting how it all gets edited down in, into these episodes. Um, but the, the uh, website, wildarchaeology.com, there is added content that you can check out as well. Uh, scenes that did not make it uh, into each episode and other material. And being in, this, in these communities was a great experience. This is in Riglet, um, <clears throat> where uh, I'm having caribou stew. Uh, and uh, I said to these kids, do you want something? And they said, giant cookies. I said, <laughs> you don't want caribou stew? And they said, no. Would they, eat th they eat that stuff all the time. Uh, we had just gotten back from a very long day of filming. And so I needed this very healthy food. Uh, but of course they wanted a treat. And so, uh, but for me, uh, I got a little teary eyed because it reminded me of being home. And uh, here's my daughter, Hera. Uh, there's my wife, Robin, on the little roller coaster and some more of my family up in Squamish. And uh, when we're in these communities, it always reminded me of home and the ties that I have to my family and my history. And so it, um, we're very fortunate in going into these communities for them to put up with us, to share their history. And really, they, um, all of them opened their arms and welcomed us. And that was uh, very encouraging. And of course, uh, Jen and Jacob and I for, have formed a, a very uh, strong bond. We look out for each other and uh, take care of each other uh, while we're away from home. Uh, I should also note, uh, Wild Archaeology is one of the uh, few TV shows out there that also airs in uh, First Nations language. Uh, Jacob and his aunt did voiceover in Dakota, and uh, I am thinking of talking to my cousins who speak Squamish to maybe do this as well. And so I think that would be fantastic to start creating these bridges with various First Nations communities uh, across the country. But the people I really want to thank are the people of the communities throughout each episode. Uh, you can see there's a big long list of names here. I can't go through them all right now. But it's without these folks, with these communities, without their consent, their participation, none of this would happen. And it would not be as interesting as it has turned out to be. And so uh, big, big thanks to, to all of these people. And so when is season two coming out? Uh, well, we did filming for four episodes this past summer. Uh, more filming is coming for the spring, summer, and fall uh, next year, where we need to do nine episodes. Then after all that filming, there's another year of post-production. So uh, this image is a little bit of a sneak peek. This is me along a grease trail up in northern uh, British Columbia. And uh, here are some of the other panoramic photos of locations that we've been to uh, <coughs> uh, through filming so far. Um, this is up at uh, Babine First Nation, Northern BC. This is up in Seashelt uh, on the Sunshine Coast. This is again in Southern Ontario at the Serpent Mound site. And uh, so we're exploring different areas, uh, different archeologists going to different communities. And again, uh, it's been encouraging uh, with the start of filming for season two that uh, uh, communities know about this show now and it's really great they're like we want you here and that's that's what we like to hear and so thank you very much i hope i didn't go too long um i guess uh andrew willfield uh president petter will uh field questions Hochka. How does this work? There we go. Perfect. Um, so this is your chance to offer comments or questions uh, of Rudy. As I say, there'll be a less formal chance afterwards. But we have some time here, and uh, you got uh, a wonderful overview of the first season. And boy, I'm really looking forward to the next one. But I guess it's going to be a while to get it all done. But uh, 
Uh, Heather back there has a microphone, so if you can indicate if you'd like to ask a question or offer a comment that you'd like Rudy to respond to, just put your hand up and Heather will come around. Someone has to be first. Uh, right, right, right back here, there's a gentleman who put up his hand, and then, and then we have Deanna up here. I think I could have listened to you for another hour. <laughs> you have a great delivery, and it's uh, humor. Um, excellent, just excellent. Thank you. I, uh, Your first review just came in. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. And uh, it, it's, it's a lot of practice that I've been teaching now since uh, 2009. And um, when you have to do a three or four hour lecture, you know, it, it, it takes some work and skill to uh, keep it interesting. So some of my students are here and uh, uh, I hope they share your views. <laughs> <laughs> and some of your colleagues are here, like the next questioner, Deanna. That's right. <laughs> Uh, and on, whether it's in a conversation one-to-one -one or in a room like this, I just am so proud to be your colleague and I just really am so grateful for the kind of work that you're doing. And my question really comes as somebody who teaches stories. I am very comfortable as a literary scholar to repeat what um, nations say to, um, to my students that we've been here since the world began. And I, I have no conflict with that. I, I don't consider myself a scientist. Instead, I think about the value of what, stories. And you as a scientist talk about the land bridge and Beringia and all those kinds of details that fade to me into like mythic time, <laughs> the time mm -hmm. before, you know, when animals could speak and people could speak to, to yeah. them. Um, and I just wonder how you coincide those two uh, you know, parts of yourself and your knowledge and the kinds of interests that you have. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? Yeah, that's a very good point. And uh, that's actually a question I asked in a recent PhD defense <laughs> uh, because the, the uh, candidate had written that a, a certain group in, down in the United States had stated they had been there since time immemorial, whereas... <clears throat> the archaeological, the linguistic, the genetic evidence, all these different other scientific lines of, of inquiry point to a totally different story. And that's something that's very difficult for archaeologists to, to cope with. And uh, in some areas, it, it's, uh, there's friction, but in other places, there is synergy. And uh, I, I do talk about some of the synergies in my dissertation and uh, in Squamish, we have this uh, a time that we refer to as Swachwiam. I hope I pronounced that right or close. Um, well, <laughs> okay. Uh, that it, it is a time that in Squamish history that is so far back that it's barely remembered. And for me, that's sort of a rough translation of time in memorial. It's uh, such ancient history that only few people know and understand it. And those stories are passed down to very select few. And so the challenge is for archeologists, and this is something I wanna do as I continue my research in Squamish territory, is start looking at place names and the connections between place names and tracing the stories of the transformers or the, these large narratives that we have and to see what is the archeological signature of that. And uh, so th this gets back to the philosophy of indigenous archeology span that's it, by considering cultural knowledge, it it expands and offers new avenues of research rather than shutting them down. Great. Um, we have a question right around here from a young member of the audience. Oh, right here, yep. What's um, your question? Why did you choose to do archaeology and what was your favorite location? Good questions. Uh, you want to restate the question, Rudy? Why did I choose to do archaeology, and what was my favorite location? Um, <laughs> Two great questions in one. When I originally went to Capilano, I wanted to, to be a geologist. I wanted to look at rocks. And I, did, I didn't do well in um, some of the hardcore math. So I fell back onto anthropology and archaeology, which I found even more interesting. And... Um, the, the faculty there and at SFU uh, were open to me exploring Squamish cultural knowledge. And so that, that was a really beneficial thing. So for me, getting into archaeology, it was looking into Squamish nation, ancient history. 
And in the season one, I guess my favorite, other than filming in Squamish, um, my favorite location probably would have been the Central Coast. Uh, go, you know, traveling with Elroy across his territory because I, I could really relate to the way he was talking about his history, about his territory. And it was kind of like listening to myself in a mirror, but I didn't have to do all the talking. It was him. In the, in the Heltzik First Nations territory. Yes. Yes. Uh, there's a gentleman up back here with his hand up, and then we'll come back over here. <clears throat> oh, hi there. Thank you for your um, <clears throat> uh, presentation. It's uh, very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I don't know how much archaeology relates to people. Of course it does in some fashion, um, and politics. Um, <clears throat> for instance, the, the archaeological findings would be Stone Age findings of the Paleolithic or Neolithic peoples at the time. Um, and this, related, uh, this relates to certain types of production, hunting, gathering, and certain types of political formations, the, the um, <clears throat> tribal nation. And uh, today, uh, like I, to admit uh, where I'm coming from, I'm against the treaty process um, because treaties are made between nations. And although Canada is a nation, the villages that they make treaties with are not nations. I'm wondering if <clears throat> I could get rescued in any fashion from science because you would know what a nation is. Can archaeology shine light on what is a nation? <clears throat> That, that's a good question and, and a difficult one to answer, really. <clears throat> in conventional archaeology, we had um, sort of stages of, of, of culture, and um, we had uh, chiefdoms, we had incipient states, uh, nations, and empires. And those are ways to define communities and cultures in various areas of the world. But... <clears throat> Uh, in the past, in archaeology, when we look at the archaeology of North America, archaeologists were did refer to many areas across the continent as sort of Stone Age societies or Neolithic societies. But as research has gone on uh, in multiple areas across the continent, we are finding evidence that there were city-states here, there were empires, there were complex cultures. And um, you know, you look at an area here on the northwest coast, well, there's no monumental architecture. Uh, the, the, in other areas, there's not this. That's not to say that those communities in those places had complex and interesting technology adaptations and so on. So we have to be a little more relative when we look at different cultures in different areas over different time periods. And so much of the archaeology in North America is is understudied. Uh, archaeology in British Columbia has only been going on in a serious fashion for over 50 years. When we compare that to the American Southwest, where we have large cities, or Mesoamerica, the history of archaeology there has been going on for well over a century. So for me, that that's the challenge of archaeology, is to, we have a lot more to find out. And so, uh, and the other thing is, I think we're moving away from those older ways of classifying uh, people and cultures. Okay, there's a question here from Sherez. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I come from Tanzania and the first time I heard about archaeology was the old Ovai Gorge, where the first man mm -hmm. was supposed to be found. And then I learned about archaeology through David Suzuki's program, Nature. He has done quite a few of archaeological series. Now yours. So so I've grown from Queen's Canada to Indigenous Canada, and I'm celebrating Indigenous Canada 150 plus by reading 50 books, watching 50 movies, and listening to 50 songs of Indigenous people. But I have problem. I, I have no problem starting the books because you can start with children's books and then continue or picture <laughs> books. Yep. But uh, I was wondering just now whether <coughs> I should start watching films, I've seen some films, but whether to recommend people to watch your series as a beginning and then follow up with the uh, most recent, uh, I mean, more, the other movies, because mm -hmm. we need 50 of them at least. Yeah. So yours is 12 already. Sure. Yeah. 
and, uh, and, and, and uh, songs, but it's one, one of each. So I, 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 I've, I have two questions. One is, how, why do you use the word wild archaeology? <laughs> and, and the second question is, how, where should I fit your programs in my 50 films? <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, good questions. And uh, in terms of finding more, uh, getting to your 50, um, there's another show called Coyote Science. Uh, I'm going to be on that as well. There's another show coming out uh, soon uh, that I and many other Indigenous archaeologists are on. It's uh, based on um, uh, Man's book, 1491. Uh, that's a very large production. But also uh, a lot of the work that Jen and Jacob and others uh, are doing, and so the, uh, this is really growing. And uh, it reminds me of a, a movie that I show in, in my classes at SFU uh, called Real Engine, that looks at the history of Indigenous people in cinema, and uh, that should be required watching as well because it, it talks about the misconceptions and uh, the the way Indigenous people have been viewed and portrayed uh, through media. Uh, in terms of wild archaeology, I had no choice in that. <laughs> Mar uh, marketing, marketing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, that was Tracy German, the uh, producer director, who uh, she just said, We're going to call it this. And I was like, All right. <laughs> um, so it, it stuck. And um, yeah, and, and sorry, your second question was. Uh, oh. You can kind of answer it, really. Yeah. Uh, maybe not the first one, but I think maybe solid top 20. <laughs> we have a question right up here. Heather, if you can bring the microphone around. Thank you for the presentation and this uh, very pretty uh, landscape and the photography and everything. And it shows that it, uh, uh, the histories of the past of thousands of years. My question is, um, uh, what role uh, you think archaeology can play actively to preserve nature in an ongoing forward, you know, on a forward basis? Mm -hmm. how, how could we contribute to that? Right. That's a very good question, and uh, it's something that I've dealt with throughout my academic and consulting career. Uh, when I finished my undergrad, or while I was doing my undergrad at SFU, uh, I got into consulting archaeology or cultural resource management, and it was a great way to make money uh, because I wasn't in class every day, and so I could go out and work and earn some extra money as a starving student. And back then, it, uh, CRM archaeology is uh, when there are developments in British Columbia, there is legislation, uh, the Heritage Conservation Act, that protects archaeological sites. And so prior to logging or new highway, there's archaeological assessments. And so I was one guy in a crew, and uh, we would go out and record sites, and they would be protected. And I thought back then, wow, okay, I'm saving this. But then I quickly realized everything around the sites that got developed. And so there were just these little pockets. And so this is when I got involved in land use planning. And uh, it, the, the perspective changed in my head where culture and heritage can be useful in not only protecting these small dots on maps, but protecting larger areas. Because when we consider not just the archaeological sites, but the cultural knowledge associated with the landscape around those sites, that they're indeed connected to a much larger place. And so in our, the land use plan that we did in the Squamish Nation in the early 2000s uh, did that. We protected large areas of old growth forest and other parts of our territory that are off limits to logging and any other sort of development. And so that's the perspective I brought forward even more when I did my PhD was looking at the connections between sites and places through the elemental chemistry of stone tools. And so it's using the tools, the scientific techniques of archeology span and combining that with cultural knowledge that we can protect the environment even more but also looking at examples like Elroy and the fish traps, the cultural knowledge about, well, if we're still going to harvest salmon, let's do it sustainably. If we're going to uh, do various other things, let's look at cultural knowledge as an option to uh, manage, maintain, preserve those things. 
One final question before we, uh, there's one right over here before we, we uh, conclude the formal part of the evening and then we'll have a chance for a bit of informal discussion afterwards. Right back there. Thank you. This has been a wonderful trip down memory lane. I, I've been an enthusiast of archaeology and the policy for many, many years. Um, when you were speaking about the, the site up north, um, it brought to mind the Ozet site. And um, that brought to mind um, my own experience. I live in Gabriel Island mm. in Snanimo Territory. And um, there's been a lot of talk recently about clam gardens. And I'm wondering if there are any archaeological um, sites um, possible in your series um, around the exploration of clam gardens. Yes, and clam gardens are fascinating features. For those of you who don't know, it's the uh, alteration of the intertidal zone to make productive clam habitat. And so these, these uh, linear rock features would be built up and uh, maintained over generations. And uh, the clams inside these gardens grow nice and big and it would be easy to dig up. And they were actually cultural property that were guarded. And uh, there is a, a, a number of archaeologists all up and down the coast looking at clam gardens right now. And uh, there's been a great article uh, I believe uh, Dana Leposky, SFU Archaeology, who was one of the, the co-authors, the, uh, they did the first scientific dating of one of these clam gardens, and it was over a thousand years old. Uh, but what is really interesting about clam gardens, again, it's similar to fish traps, it was the purposeful alteration of the environment, it's, it's aquaculture, and it was sustainable, it was environmentally sound. So it's another form of cultural knowledge that we should be using in modern day because there are shellfish farms just like there are fish farms and other things here on our coast. And so, again, it's looking at cultural knowledge on how can we imply this in modern day so that uh, uh, everyone benefits. Well, like you, I want to join with others who've uh, expressed appreciation to Rudy and, and share the pride that Deanne and others expressed to have uh, colleagues and scholars like Rudy at SFU. And Rudy, what I love about your talk is it really brings to the fore the values that I hope we as a university are trying to pursue more generally. You know, when we talk about an engaged university, we're really pushing back on the old traditional view of a university, which uh, traditional universities looked at the outside world as the subjects of their research, not as sources of knowledge, not as places where the university can learn and gain sustenance and knowledge. And your research is all about finding knowledge outside the university and bringing it into the university and sharing it with the public. And the other thing that I so often say, in, 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 of course, historically, universities in Canada excluded Indigenous peoples. They couldn't come to university. And thankfully, that has changed. Uh, and the point that I think Rudy, Rudy's presentation points out is not only is that hopefully to the benefit of Indigenous people and students, but it's hugely to the benefit of Canada generally to have this knowledge, to learn about things we never would have found out about except through the teachings of Indigenous people uh, is such a privilege. And so uh, I, I really thank you for that. Um, I also want you to know that we as a university are striving, not imperfectly, to be an instrument for reconciliation. And next week, in fact, we'll be receiving a report from our Aboriginal Reconciliation Council, which has done much consultation as to how we can do even more to indigenize the university, to have the university be an instrument for uh, this kind of research and for the processes of reconciliation. That'll take place on Monday uh, up on, 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 on the campus, and I hope it will propel us to do even more and to support scholars like Rudy and, and others to do even more as well. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, and uh, I encourage you to look on the SFU Public Square website for future faculty lectures. In fact, I can give you a heads up on the date for the next, the next uh, President's Faculty Lecture will be on January 31st, right here in this room. And award-winning communications professor, uh, Yuji Zhao, uh, creator of the Global Communication Double MA Degree Program, which is a quite a remarkable program, will be here. Um, and I also encourage you to, uh, to look for other uh, events that take place because, of course, we are trying very much to reach out and share with the community and also to benefit from our relationship 
with the community uh, through this kind of engagement. So thank you for being here, and please join me in a very warm and appreciative thank you to Dr. Rudy. Wendell.